Hi everybody. Uh, today we're going to be doing experiment number three, which is the identification of an unknown compound, in particular an unknown liquid. We have a bunch of these various unknowns. They all look the same. They all basically look like water, but please don't taste them because that would be very bad. Most of them are similar to gasoline. They're not extremely hazardous, but they are very flammable, which is why I'm going to be moving my equipment into the hood in a few minutes when we begin the experiment. So essentially to identify the unknown, we have, we're going to use three different physical property tests. We haven't really got much into chemistry yet since the, the semester is young. So we're going to stick mainly right now with physical properties of, of substances. So the first thing we're going to do is to test the solubility. If you look at the table in your lab book, it shows the solubility of each of the 27, 27 different unknowns that you might have. So to do the solubility test, we're simply going to take a test tube, add a sample of our unknown, add some deionized water, and then mix those together and observe whether they remain mixed together or they separate. If they remain mixed together, then you have a soluble unknown. And if they separate, your unknown is insoluble. So based on that first test, you'll be able to narrow down the identity. Either your unknown is going to be one of those with the letter I next to it for insoluble, or the letter S for soluble. When you finish with the first part, of course, we're going to be putting our unknown liquid and water into a waste container. So we have waste containers handy. If you were here on campus, that's what you would be doing. And of course, you would also be wearing gloves if you like to have those, but definitely you would be wearing safety glasses. And when I do the experiment in a few minutes, I will be wearing these things. The second part of the lab you should be well familiar with because you just did it last week, and that is measuring a density. So we're going to measure the density of the unknown liquid the same way we did water back in the density experiment. That is, we're going to weigh in a dry, clean, 10 mil graduated cylinder, and then we will add to that between 9 and 10 milliliters of our unknown liquid. We'll weigh the cylinder again, determine the mass, and then we will read the meniscus to get the volume, and that will give us the density of our unknown liquid. In that table in the lab book, there's also a list of all the densities of the various elements. If you are reasonably careful in the density test, you should be able to get within about 0 0.02 grams per milliliter of your actual density. So if you got, say, 0 0.80, you might go as high as, say, 0.82 or as low as 0.78. Figure it falls somewhere in there. I find students very commonly get even within a hundredth of a gram per milliliter. So it's a pretty accurate test if you follow the same techniques we learned last time. This material, of course, will also go into our waste container when we finish. So by the time you've done these two tests, you've now narrowed the unknown down significantly. It has to have the right solubility and the right density. At this point, out of those 27 possibilities, you've probably narrowed it down to two or three. So the third test we're going to do is a boiling point test. There's a diagram in the lab book that shows how to set this up, and I've got it set up here just for you to observe. And then we're going to be moving this into the hood for safety because we're going to be boiling highly flammable liquids using an open flame, which could be a recipe for disaster, but we're going to be very careful. So the way we have it set up is we have a beaker here that we're going to fill about half full of deionized water. We're going to heat our unknown liquid in a beaker of water rather than directly with the Bunsen burner. Because if, we, if the test tube were to boil over or it were to crack and break and that flammable liquid landed on the burner, we're going to have a giant fireball. So by heating it in boiling water, if the liquid were to boil over, it will simply land in the water and then we can dispose of it safely. The downside of this is, and this is something you have to think about for the questions at the end of the lab, and that is, question number two says, which unknowns are going to be difficult to measure their boiling point 
using this setup. So take a look at those unknowns in the table and see if you can figure out which unknowns are going to be problematic using this water boiling technique and why, because you'll be asked to explain that. So we've got our, our beaker with the water. We're going to put some unknown into the test tube. I usually put about three fingers or so. It's not critical. The amount doesn't matter. It's going to boil at the same temperature, whatever. So I find that that, that amount, about you know three fingers or so of liquid in the test tube, is simply a convenient amount. We're going to add to the test tube a boiling stone or two. These are just basically pieces of rock. They're just ground up pieces of rock. And what those pieces of rock do is they make the liquid boil nice and smoothly. It keeps the liquid from suddenly just boiling over like sometimes happens on your stove at home. If it happens on the stove, not a big deal. If gas boiling gasoline boils over, a eh, much bigger deal. So we want to make sure we put a couple of those boiling stones in there to keep it boiling gently. And then just as the diagram shows, we're going to lower the test tube into the water so that the liquid level inside the test tube is a little bit higher than the water. And then when we place our thermometer in the test tube, we're going to make sure that the thermometer bulb is a little bit above the unknown liquid. The thermometer is held by a rubber stopper and the stopper allows us to move the thermometer up and down so we can adjust it until it's just where we want it to be. So why don't we head on over to the lab and we'll start carrying out each of these three parts of the experiment and you can see if you'll be able to identify the unknown liquid. All right, let's begin with the solubility test. So first of all, let's put our safety equipment on. So we've got some safety glasses and some laboratory gloves. Now we'll do the solubility test in a large test tube, make it easier for you folks to see. So I'm going to add some water. doesn't matter whether you add the water first or the unknown, it won't make any difference. So we'll just add a bit of water in there. And then we're going to add to that some of unknown number seven, like so. And then we'll swirl the liquids around thoroughly to get them to mix together. And then we watch to see what happens. As you can see, the two liquids are separating from each other. So what does it mean when the liquids separate and they don't remain mixed together? That means, of course, that you have an insoluble unknown. So based on this first test, you can narrow down the identity of your unknown to one of those in the table with the letter I after it, which means insoluble. Now that we've completed the solubility test and we've managed to narrow down the identity of our unknown a little bit, let's continue on and do the density test. So like we did in, in the previous week's experiment, we'll first have to weigh the empty dry cylinder to get our baseline. And then we're going to add to that between 9 and 10 milliliters of our unknown. So this is unknown number seven, and I've transferred it to a squirt bottle, which makes it a little easier to use here. So we're going to add enough unknown to get that between the nine and 10 milliliter mark. There we go. And we can get the mass now with the unknown, and simply subtracting those two will give us the mass of our unknown liquid, and now we simply need to measure the volume. Now go ahead and uh, record the volume of your unknown liquid, and then use the mass and the volume to determine the density, and then you should be able to narrow down the identity of your unknown to just two or three possibilities before we move on to the boiling point test. Since most of you haven't had chemistry before, I'm guessing that a lot of you have never seen or at least used a Bunsen burner. So before we get started on the boiling point um, experiment, I want to show you how the Bunsen burner works. It's pretty simple. 
We have a lot of these little blue tabs along the lab here that say gas on them, so obviously that's our gas outlet. You simply hook the Bunsen burner hose to that, and then before you get started, you have to do two things. There is a wheel on the bottom of the Bunsen burner that rotates either clockwise or counterclockwise. So we're going to rotate it clockwise up until it's completely off. So that shuts the gas off. The barrel of the burner can rise up or down. So we want to put it all the way down to shut the airflow off. So at the beginning, no air can get in, no gas can get in. I'm going to go ahead and give the gas valve just a little quick turn, maybe half a rotation, and now we're ready to go. At this point, there's no gas coming through, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start rotating the valve a little bit till I hear gas coming out. Okay, I hear the gas, so we'll take our little flint striker here and light the burner. Now that's not a very good flame because if it's yellow like that, it means it needs oxygen. So we're going to start opening up the air by rotating the barrel of the burner up. That lets air in and we want to get a nice hot roaring flame. You might even be able to hear that if you listen carefully. If the flame is too big or too small, we can adjust the height then with the little wheel on the bottom. So I can rotate that, make the flame smaller if I wish, or I can make it larger. When you finish with the Bunsen burner, just go back to that little blue valve there, turn it off, and you're good to go. All right, looks like we're ready to go for our boiling point test. I've got my gloves, safety glasses, even a lab coat. Everything has been set up in the hood, so why don't we just move in a little bit closer so you can have a better view of what's going to be happening. All right, it looks like everything is ready to go for our boiling point test. We have the beaker, a little more than half full of water. The unknown in the liquid in the test tube is a little bit above the level of water, which is good. And the bulb of the thermometer is just above the liquid in the test tube. So we are ready to go. So let's go ahead and fire up the Bunsen burner. Looks like the wheel valve is closed and so is the air valve. So we'll go ahead and open up the gas, rotate the valve till we hear some gas coming. There we go. So we'll light that up. There we go. Open the air valve. Get some air in there. And we'll put that underneath. And now it's going to take some time. To keep the wind from the hood from blowing the flame around too much, we're going to go ahead and lower down the shield here. And now we just got to wait for a while. It'll take a few minutes for the water to heat up enough to boil the unknown liquid, and then we'll come back. Okay, and there it goes. It's beginning to boil. You can see it boiling pretty vigorously inside the tube. I'll show you in a moment. You can see the alcohol rising up very rapidly. And when it levels off, that will be our boiling point. Now that the liquid's beginning to boil, the temperature rises very rapidly. It usually only takes about maybe 20 or 30 seconds for the uh, alcohol to reach its maximum and level off, or at least close to level off. And then we'll give it maybe 30 seconds to a minute to make sure that it's not rising significantly. It might go up a little bit, but not too much. It's been rising up. It's up to about 77 now. So we'll give it about 30 seconds or a minute to finish leveling off, and that should be our boiling point. It's up to 78. It's moving very slowly now. And it looks like it's leveled off at 78 degrees, so that will be our boiling point. 
These thermometers are not extremely accurate. They can be off by several degrees either way because although the alcohol thermometers are safe and inexpensive, they're not nearly as accurate as the old mercury thermometers. But as long as we're within a few degrees, it should be pretty easy to identify your unknown correctly.